Hello, so welcome. Um, you all know me. My name is Mr. Joe. I'm a coach to CEOs of both fast growing tech businesses, but also to larger enterprises and publicly listed companies. And this is my ongoing series where I talk to people who are just really interesting. And we're going to be talking more about culture today. And I'm really excited to be joined by a fantastic expert in culturalization and also an old friend of mine, Chui Chui Tan. Do you want to introduce yourself, Chui Chui? Hi, Joe. Um, thanks for having me here. So yeah, I'm Chui Chui Tan. I'm Malaysian-born um, Chinese. And um, but I have been living in the UK for just over 20 years now, a long time. Um, so uh, background, I, I started off as mechanical engineer and working for a Japanese company, um, Panasonic, designing their audio vi video, um, audio video sets um, for a few years. And before I decided to come to the UK and do master in music technology, and then um, one thing leads to the other, I actually end up doing a PhD um, in helping visually impaired um, people um, on accessing graphic. And that actually leads me to the world of um, human computer interactions, user experience, and whatever that it is now um, the world of understanding um, users. Um, but for the last 15, 16 years, I have been doing some, um, uh, focusing a lot on understanding international um, users or customers and what that means to businesses. Um, since I work for myself, um, and, um, by a big bear global, I help businesses to kind of navigate cultural complexity to, to grow globally, um, across different, the whole business, not just design um, team or not just a marketing team or so on, but it's just a whole, um, holistic view of the, the business, um, from helping them to expand, um, into new markets or to. Um, to take their existing market into the next level or, or trying to turn around um, any of their underperforming market and essentially to kind of optimize the, the, the market successfully. So um, over the years, I probably have helped them on over 50 countries um, or markets now that like talk okay. understanding people from different countries and um, 50 markets as such. Um, and now I'm, I'm I'm focusing a lot on helping and advising businesses and C-level management or senior management on how to uncover um, their global growth opportunities. But from the step strategic um, culturalization point of view, yeah. like really delving into like, local context and audience dynamics and so on. Uh, so, yeah, so it's a lot of times kind of sounding board and also help them to figure out um, what efforts and budget um, they should put in where, um, like for example, where as in the markets or countries, but also in which area within the markets that need to put in um, and why, and also how the efforts they put in should look like as well and just guide them to figure that out. Um, so I'm writing a book as well on um, a survival book, the books on help practitioners and, and managers to understand how to go about um, doing international research to understand um, their audiences to make strategic business. Okay. Really interesting stuff. And can you share, who do you work with? Can you give some examples of companies that you've worked with over the years? Sure. Um, so I work with Spotify for um, probably more than over 40 countries now um, on their pre-launch and everything. So I, I, yeah, it's one of my key clients that I work across the whole business um, across a region. Uh, I also work with Bumble. Um, dating um, uh, was, um, company and also yeah. um, Netflix and, and also a few company in Asia like and Stick or Job Street, they are equivalent of Indeed in APEC, um, New yeah. Zealand, Australia, Asia, mm. um, Fiverr and it's Babylon really companies then. Yeah. yeah, really interesting. Wow, fantastic. So I love that concept you talked about then. There's sort of, you know, you're, you're working with those C-suite executives really to help them understand cultural challenges they're facing and right, why I suppose certain markets for them internationally are successful and certain ones aren't. So oh. can you share, let's talk practical stuff then. So if you are say in a US corporation, right, you're, you're huge in the US, you're growing really, really fast and you want to launch internationally, where do you kind of start from that? Because everybody says we want to do that, but how do you, mm. how do you start that? How do you make that leap from one location to another? How do you start that? Let's start yeah. there. 
that is a big question, isn't it? Like where, well, where it's a big where? question. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think it's one thing. It's kind of sometimes good to step back. Like a lot of companies tend to think like, oh, we wouldn't think about international. Organizations or going in the new market until our home market, so for example, in the US for your client, um, that we're, um, that we're happy with the growth here, where then we go out and to it. But I think this is one of the misperceptions that are actually trying to kind of um, demystify as well. It's like you some even when you start a business or at very beginning, you should start already have um, the global in mind as well. Like for example, things from the beginning, so that you can build and. Um, a scalable and adaptable tech solutions, for example, or propositions that could address the needs from other markets as well. And with that as well, um, your team and your, um, yourself or the business could actually have a wider vision of actually while, while launching in the US now, but in the future when we go out, we are, we are ready to do it. So that's great. So that's one th- that. But I love that idea where you start early on, don't you? You think about that from day one almost. You don't wait till you're home market is saturated and growth is not you know you've, you've grown as far as you can you, and you're, say, what you're next? already looking ahead yeah, yeah. then where next you, yeah. so you're thinking where next almost right from the start you've got a plan from early on in your business development i love yeah. that because you know like once you grow a business it's not just one market if you want to grow the business properly for years and being sustainable then it has to think from the very beginning as well uh, yeah. and you don't want to kind of get to a point that you build something that works for you as an it's like oh it doesn't work for any other other places and then you right. have to rebuild yeah. your things and then you have to you know invest more on other things as well and then back to your questions about like where do you even start so like i think a common question i always get is like okay where's the next market i should go to like like should i go to the same language um if it's size easier um and even if i go same language for example spanish then that is that's me sorted because i'm covering spanish and also latin america like that would be yeah. a big, big market so I kind of like that is one thing that I always like stop, stop, stop for a second and think about that um, to start with. Sure, a language thing is kind of quite easy to think about, but there are so many different things that um, will contribute to the success or not when you're in the You could have the language translated easily or you say it's English market. I can easily go to the UK or Australia because it's English. And so you will get there, but whether or not your business is going to grow um, in the way that you want, that is another matter. Like you could have a website at this. You can have uh, the products at this in that market, but your your subs- your your subscriptions um, or your growth or your profits revenue is probably not going to be kind of equivalent to what you have in 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 your home market. So one thing that I normally will do with um, clients sometimes at, or, or or management. It's like, okay, let's step back a bit, like see which market you have in mind. Sure, you have a few markets and then you have a hypothesis as well, like why you think that market is a good one to go for. So, but then what exercise to do is think about two dimensions for me. It's one is like, think about the effort level that you have to put in for that market. And then also, if you want to say that it's more on potentials of that market. So okay. then you can map it out. Um, so for example, you can say, um, this is a big market. Uh, this is good in the potential side because uh, it has a very huge population. Um, my time, my total addressable market or uh, in my serviceable uh, addressable market is going to be big because um, then that means it's a good thing. So there's high potential. But also you need to think about um, efforts. What efforts is going to be? Like, for example, is that going to be have a lot of this because it's a different language. So you need to figure out, you need to invest a bit more time on that. But it's also the legislation is very different in that market. Mm. Um, you need to go through a lot of regulations um, and everything to, to kind of be approved or certain things. Or you need to think about, actually, do you need to educate or change the behavior of that market so that it will come to you and use of it. So then the effort level will go really high. And that means you need a lot more investments. Even the potentials, the town is really high, but that, you know, that might not go together. So I think it's this kind of exercise kind of also questioning the hypothesis or the reason why you think you should go to this potential market. You start to questioning it and kind of validate it. Um, um, you might have the answer to most of them, but sometimes you probably need to do a bit of desk research um, to understand, you know, like the thing that I talk about regulations or any things that 
you need to figure out to say, okay, if we go to in that market with our products, then what does that mean? It might be easy for one market. So for example, American company might um, in the industry that it's easy to go into Spanish market, for example. But actually Mm. for the other company in the US that sell completely different products, it might be really hard for them if you go to the uh, Spanish market because it's a different thing that they are targeting and and behavior. So, yeah, so I think like kind of going step back to uh, to look into a bigger picture of all the markets that you think about before you decide. I think that's one of the things. So you don't just invest something on just and then waste your money. Yeah, put a lot of effort and invest a lot of time and resources and money into it and then actually not gain what yeah. you expected to gain. I mean, I love that. Those axes you mentioned as well, you know, the potential versus the the effort involved, because you're all about always thinking about potential. That's the one that's going to drive you forward. But the effort may be a lot smaller. You know, I think we've had experiences of UK companies launching in the Netherlands, like in Holland is the first choice, right? Very low potential, but really similarly low effort. And that can work very well in this, you know, very well for a UK, UK company going into Europe. So the big one then is always China, isn't it? That's the one. That's the one with the most potential, is seen as having the most potential. So if you want to be a truly global company, like China has to be on your radar, doesn't it? That's the one you you should go into first, or the should be your big goal, your long term goal should be China, shouldn't it? Um, I think that statement probably is true for, um, from what I have been observing in the industry and working with um, clients across um, the globe. Yeah, it probably was true, like until five six years ago. Um, okay. So. My time before that, like, yeah, I be, I actually traveled to the China a lot. Uh, I speak Mandarin, so that is kind of easy for me and my my mother tongue. And all companies like China, China, let's go and go understand. But in the last few years, I have to say it's the other way around. Well, two in two layer, two levels. One is I don't I don't get a lot of uh, clients saying we are going to China anymore, um, and they are actually exploring other markets for example the key ones now is india and indonesia okay you know like latin america is always one yeah. like big ones but um but if we talk about markets and um india and indonesia big populations as well potential development um, more potentials in a lot of um uh, adoptions of um, technology and, and so on as well. yeah um so yeah those are bigger markets now um people think the other thing about China as well, I think more and more companies start to realize that it's quite a closed ecosystem. I think there are two layers. One is closed ecosystem in a way that um, it's quite hard to break into because they, they have their own market, very strong market. You talk about music, Spotify is not in there and I don't think they have intentions to go in um, anytime yeah. soon because they already have a lot of very, very strong music, audio streaming platforms Mm -hmm. you talk about uber or anything like they already have dd uh, quite and you know all this um they already have everything that's very solid they have baidu (laughs) google you know all this so it's quite hard to break into now and the other thing i observe is instead of going into china now actually a lot of chinese company wants to get out so they're actually expanding right how do we get into southeast asia how do we go into Mm -hmm. europe um, so I think I think trend has been changing slightly now. It's still a good market, a big market, um, it's no doubt. But I think um, businesses have been looking into a different way. Um, okay. And so China's got that high potential, but high effort. Then really, that's the difference. There's now it's there. become more and more effort, yeah. high potential because just purely because of the population. But then if you look at population, Africa as a region is one, and then India itself as and then Indonesia is a big market. So. Yeah. And they have both potential, but the effort is a little less for India and Indonesia. Is that the sort of what you're saying? The, the effort involved in going there is easier? Not yeah, surprising. I would, in, in, in many ways, you still have a lot of efforts, right? Because you still yeah. have to break a lot of like, like different cultural yeah. uh, norms and nuances. But I think in terms of ecosystem wise, and also I think um, legislation and regulations probably is another thing that of course, right. harder to get in. Oh, interesting. And so uh, let's talk about Another possible scenario then that you probably hear that, so you know, I'm the CEO of a big, of a multinational, right? And my division in say, let me ch- choose an area like the Middle East, right? Is not successful. Everywhere else in the world, I'm doing pretty well, but my one division in one part of the globe isn't doing very well. Let's 
I'm going to take Middle East as an, an example of that. Um, outside of kind of global economic, you know, global factors around that, but what should I do if one of my international divisions isn't isn't as successful as I'd like it to be? What can I do? Um, so there are a lot of ways to approach. So when I talk about people, I talk to people about that I'm, I'm helping businesses on their international growth, and that could mean a lot of things, right? But my from my point, from my perspectives, perspectives, and also how I deal to look into it, it's kind of step back on looking into. I think it's good to look into your data and um, to start with, like where what are the things like where are the draw off and why. Uh, to get as much information as possible uh, in terms of what data you have, like how people, mm -hmm. how your users, for example, in the media is kind of um, looking, look, um, like how they look like for now uh, and so on. Um, yeah. And then get as much insight as possible. And you can, from there, you can create some hypothesis of why you think the, 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 it's not growing as much as you want in at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then on that sense as well, it's like Middle East is big, right? Like, do you have a sense of like which market? Kind of break it down slightly. Like, are you talking about Dubai or UAE? Or are you talking about Saudi? Or are you talking about any other like um, uh, markets in, in, and see whether there's a... a because that's a, a key difference. point there, isn't it, right? Is that I talked about in the Middle East, there is one unit of countries, Arabic-speaking countries, right? But they're not all the same, are they? Arabic speaking countries. Oh, very, very much different. So I just came back from Saudi Arabia actually um, two months last month, yeah. um, and that is very different from Dubai. Like you know, it, it's I think Middle East um, market is very interesting because there's potential, there's money, there are, you know there are a lot that is growing in a lot of markets, but there are so another elements of um, um, religions within that as well. So yeah. each countries within the region, Middle East regions, they have different way of uh, approach their Islamic um, teachings and, and so on. So, right. you know, like Dubai is very international and they take mm. them years to get to that point. And Saudi Arabia is opening up with reformations and it's a process. And then there's certain countries still, you know, like growth. So there are a lot of different layers to look into and expats versus locals. And, you know, like there are a yeah. lot of elements and who are you targeting uh, when you talk about that? And then even within a market, for example, talking about Saudi Arabia because it just came back and it's like there's a lot of different um, la layers of um, groups as well. Uh, we call it SEC or social economy um, levels. Like, are you talking yeah. about you are targeting the rich one or actually um, the lower level? So I think there are a lot of knowing, understanding who you're actually targeting, who you should target and, and you are targeting versus will be yeah. important. And um, yeah, I think for me, when I talk about growth is like look at your data and then look into more granularity. So when I talk mm -hmm. about culture, people always think about as just the people, how they behave, you know, their beliefs and attitude. But actually you have to think about the holistic view of that market because mm -hmm. how, they, how they behave and how they think, how, going to, how they expect your product to be or interact with your product, very much influenced by their environment, right? And we're talking yeah. about the history of the countries and the, the, the I talk about uh, religions and it could be the political setup throughout the years that shape who they are or te technology infrastructure that they have, they are being given this infrastructure in this country. So that's how they behave, mm -hmm. going to behave because they have to go through, put up with a very um, slow um, internet or actually super fast. So their behavior changed slightly different and what they need from you is slightly different. So it's kind of looking into the whole picture of what does that yeah. mean? Um, contradictions you might see on their behaviors, like why? We see a lot of contradictions behavior in, in Saudi, yeah. for example. Like they say this, like this means it should behave like that, but no, but this because of another element. So you need to understand that so that it helps you to do the right decisions on what you should adapt on your current business or propositions. Okay. Um, or you shouldn't change anything, but you need yeah. to kind of um, look into something else to enhance other things. No, I really like that. So it's the idea that because I just said Arabic speaking countries or a division, which is the Middle East, is that too broad, right? The more you mm -hmm. focus down to the detail in each individual country, you'll see trends of the data in different places, right? And different communities within that. And that's where the answer lies, not across the wider division, because it's easy for us to say that from our HQ, Middle East is not performing, but the reality is, is it's much more subtle than that. Certain countries are going to be different. Certain groups within that are going to be different. And you need to understand that 
to be able to make a difference and to make the change you need to make. Yeah, it's okay. very it's very important. And also, I talk about like understanding them. There's so much data or information or insights you can get from everywhere. It's, you know, like yeah. I think ultimately the whole thing is about really properly understanding the the, the who you are serving and how they behave and how and yeah. that kind of. St- but not just them, but also look into your own businesses. So I look back as well on mm-hmm. your business, like how that align with your own business, how that align with your your propositions, because you don't want to change your identity too much. Of course. Um, to the point that people don't recognize you as brand, because sometimes yeah. international brand is actually a good thing in that market. You want to use that as a as a leverage, but then at the same time, you want to kind of fit into their cultural nuances as well. Like right. where is the balance and. So it's kind of creating empathy for the business, but also creating empathy for the users and find the balance between. Oh, I love that. And it sounds as well like a, a skill of a, a C-suite operative or a CEO looking at these divisions is understanding you don't know everything about that country. You can't, and I don't think you're going to take a stereotype, but you're not going to take a broad brush to what you think is going on. There's going to be a lot of subtleties as to why a country is successful or not successful that maybe you as an individual are not aware of and you can't mm-hmm. see because it's not something you've, come across before yeah and it's funny it's uh, talking about like everyone have their own point of view of what they think the market especially cc like you very smart people right they probably have a lot of knowledge in in how they see a uh, different market or how they see how they can build into a different market but sometimes one of the exercises i actually do quite a lot with um, businesses before we even say if let's say we want to grow indonesia market like like where to start or yeah. what should we do and everything i gather them together to do exercise to get again in I call it four bucket exercise. So it's yeah. kind of like okay, tell everyone, everyone tell everyone like what you know already or what you think or know already, and, and then you like put four it in bucket. This. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One is mm-hmm. like facts, like it's sure, it's definitely fact. Like everyone knows that we have, and then the other one is yeah. strong hypothesis. Like I think we very sure, but we want to. You need a bit more to kind of add the, the ingredient into it and make it stronger. Or make it into the fact. I think that's great. If you have a strong hypothesis, move them into it. And then you have the third bucket is um, weak hypothesis. Like, I think so, mm-hmm. yeah, but not sure, maybe. And then last one is unknowns. It's like, unknowns is a tricky one because you don't know what you don't know. But actually, it's quite, sometimes it's good to say, like, how do they even look for um, candidates? You know, like very wise um, questions. Yeah. That's fine. Um, when I do this exercise, um, you can see a lot of posters is going to the fact ones because everyone we know that we heard it and everything. Yeah. And then what, once I start telling them, I'm going to grow through one by one, and then whoever will put in, I have to say why they know it's a fact. You need to give us resources. Mm-hmm. And then when I ask asking one person about that, you can slowly see the 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 other posters is moving <laughs> to, to, to <laughs> I love that. because they don't have anything to back it up. It's yeah. like, okay, maybe it's not fact. So I think that's important because otherwise you're going to make a decision. So it's fact, we not, don't need to uh, validate or invalidate them anymore. Um, yeah. And then your decision is going to, business decision is going to make from that. And it might be a wrong one. And you you know, it's kind of, yeah, it's, you put your shit aside into the foot if you kind of say that. So I think that is a good one to do. And then from there, you can say, okay, strong hypothesis and weak and that. Like, then you can start analyzing what we need to know to actually go back to the market, say, go back to the core reason, like we want to grow this market. And so grow, like what does that mean? Grow in terms of you want to just have more users, even though there are yeah. free users, it's fine. Or you want to have paid users or right. you want them to engage on your on your site for more than an hour a day or whatever, like what they want to product come back every month. So understanding that is important is great. Wow, I love that. But that exercise is great because, like you say, that that just then gets everything out of the system. All those beliefs you you think you have of a country that are going to make it harder than you think it might be to to do any work or launch into that country. I love that really because you know when we've worked together before, we've heard many of these. Like you know, Japan is an impossible market to break into. You know, Koreans don't like purple or black. You know, all of these <laughs> beliefs that people believe to be the case that ultimately aren't what are yeah. some of the most unusual beliefs that you've heard then what, what are some of the stereotypes oh. or difficulties that aren't simply true out there i think i was talking to a new zealander there one day it's just like everyone say australian us is the same it's like no we're not the same with like 
<laughs> I think that's one of very easy one people because it's the English. So Australians speaking. and New Zealanders are the same. That's a good one, right? Absolutely. That's it. It's a yeah. very a different culture. Because, because with different cultures, close enough because they're so far yeah. away from the world, yeah. and the English speaking, but actually they have a very different um, thought on that as well. And what was the one about Korea? What's the colour in Korea that people you're not supposed to use? Can you remember that one? You I don't even one. remember that because it's I black don't care. I don't think it's. I don't think one of these sort of think... Italians don't like purple. I remember all these <laughs> myths that we've heard. Because really colour seems... to me. So the other thing I saw online, like, you know, if you kind of Google cultural like things, like, you can find a lot of them. And so I just, like, sometimes I just like front of. Yeah, <laughs> it's like talk about. And then they will use, they use a lot of reasons. They, Oh yeah, they like this color because of this. It represents this. This represents that. But actually, yeah, sure. This color plays some elements within what you kind of provide. You, if you don't, you could kind of show. Like for example, red is kind of like risk and then warning and things like that. And sure, Asian like Chinese and us and like re, like red is good thing. Chinese New Year coming soon, and we will all wear red. We have red pockets yeah. where everything is red. But also, it it is also still represent warnings as well you know like if you yeah. kind of warning so some some color is actually quite cross right so just um, another myth is the color thing that's really good to hear yeah, yeah. and the other thing as well like there are someone told me yesterday on linkedin as well on a post like people talk about hostess um you know Hofstede, you yeah the cultural yeah. dimensions yeah it's good it's i talk it gave a talk i did bring it out it's, it's a good reference for people to know power distance versus um and then also the feminist Feminine. Yeah, so Feminine. Hofstede talks about cultural, like um, in individualistic Dimension. and collective society, doesn't yeah. it? Like individualistic. Yeah, he has is very five or six. Americans, I can do it on my own, whereas collectivistic is like Japan together. and China, where we are it's... a group together. We have to do things together. Yes. Which Hofstede. is good, which is a good reference. Um, like, for example, like uh, one example, like um, we did research on um, a journal, um, at, um, journals. Um, medical journals um, online and people mm. like in, in the Europe were saying like, oh, who, what is the, um, what is the publications and, and so on. Like they ask very specific questions. Whereas in Asia, on Japan, basically people asking like, oh, who else actually you quote this? Who else actually think this is a good article? Yeah. Think about other people. So yes, there's elements on that um, dimension is useful. But also I find that really hard to put it in a perspective. Like, Okay, if it is feminism and also all collectivist and individualistic, one country and the other, and you design a website for example, like what? How do you convert that? Like, do you? Yeah. Does it do mean? you? Yeah, and it's yeah. also down down to the designer and down to whoever who designs to say, oh, because they are individualistic, we should we should design this. That is subjective view. Um. So yeah, I think it's a good reference to start to understand different culture. But I, I, yeah, I think to be practical, you just have to be very careful of what you've seen out there, well, what that. you read out there. Even sometimes, you know, when I was doing the four bucket exercise, like people yeah. saying, "Yeah, the local team, the local sales team, or local tell tell me tell us this," and with that, I wouldn't put in fact as well because there's certain elements of um, bias and and personal mm. view by the local person um, local sales team as well so it might it might be true in certain like layer but it might be also their own perspective as well so with okay. that i always feel like you should still change it because i mean that then brings us towards the that, that classic question then so if an international team like a team in a particular country isn't performing right well you that's the perception because they are culturally different from us in the us or the uk that's also not also often the case then, is it? The, the cultural differences within the, how the team operate in a particular country compared to the main organization. Talk us through that. What are the kind of some of the, the mishaps and mistakes that people make in that, in that part of dealing with an what international What do you mean? Do you mean like when they have international team, they run slightly differently? What do you mean? Sorry. So a team in a specific country isn't performing or seen as not being performing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's seen as being a cultural reason why they're not performing, like... And I'm going to say this, like Brits are not great salespeople, for example. You could say that. Well, the Brits are not great at salespeople. That's why we don't sell much more in the UK. Like yeah. challenges what like that it? come yeah. out. So damn, it's, 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 it's not good. <laughs> As yeah. we all know, it's to, to, to just say like, oh, because they're not, because of one reason. I think it's quite good. It will be interesting to kind of look into why. So it yeah. might be the, the, the team itself is not really the right team to run mm -hmm. um, the market. 
um, it might be the case, then you might have to look into like changing the name or shuffle around or, or whatever. But it also might be because the, the setup of the business or how the business is being uh, set in the US, for example, and the local team can't do much to change that. Right. That limited what they can do with the market, so they might be restricted with the um, with mm. the limitations of what they can do. That cost them the reason or uh, make them the reason that they can grow the business. It might be the case, or it might be the local team actually didn't really properly understand what is missing as well. Even they are locals, right. they might missed certain elements um, that cultural nuances that they are so familiar with, but they didn't see that as an opportunity. Yeah. This happens as well when we do research. If you use, we see that, uh, I see that again and again in local in, in research. You use a local researcher to do interviews and everything. And I sit in and I kind of, oh, that is very interesting what they say. Can you promote? And this is like, yeah, but this is very normal. Like, why is it so, you know, like, why are you so excited about obvious. knowing this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's actually was a key thing for us because it's so different that make them so unique. We should do something about it. So sometimes um, local um, experts or, or might actually oversee something that too close to them. Yeah. It might be the case. So I think it's kind of like be be good for if you say the team is not, um, is that because of the team or because we don't know the business as well? I think it's good to investigate what causing That's really interesting. the limitations of those. Yeah, back to the data again, digging in deep to understand what's really going on rather than relying on a perceived stereo, not going to say stereotype, perceived belief about something as well. Oh, yeah. I love that. That's a really nice. And way sometimes, to think. sometimes you don't even need a very strong data to give a sense or a, a, a niggly, like a, a fit, like where to even start, like talking to the yeah. team and looking into, you know, how they set up. Go out and and spend a day or two in their environment, in their office, to to see how they actually mm, interact, the that. pain that they're having. Go out with them to see your local customers for a bit and. Yeah. Even going out not to talk about your business or everything for you to understand how that feels in that environment, um, that right. will be a good great start. Great insight. Hey, we've, we've almost run out of time here. Thank you so much for your time. I've really loved it and enjoyed this conversation. So much insight there about international and culturalization. So thank you. How no can um, people learn and find out more about you? Where can they get more from, mm. from you? Should we, should we? Um, I'm most active on LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, send me invitations. Um, and um, or, or connecting like you heard of, of yeah. Joe's um, I'll put the link down there for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, my website is the other one, bayo.global, um, where I sometimes put um, stuff and um, my yeah. books and everything else. And really every good. year, every year I actually wrote a wrap up as well on the work I did um, for the last five years. Oh, years it's so. amazing to see yeah. where you've been and what work you do <laughs> and just the countries you visited and the insight. And it, it also strikes me in talking to you as well that there's a lot of short that shortcuts that people can take just by talking to you. So rather than sort of doing what you said, they can just, you know, get in touch with you and you can actually get them somewhere quite much quicker than if they're trying to figure out a lot of this stuff themselves as well. So like if you're out there, folks, get in touch with you. <laughs> yeah, rather I'm than happy just to like, talk. You know, just get on with it. Because you could save you a lot of time and effort in terms of dealing with some of these things just by having yeah. a, you know, you know, just buying a bit of her time. It sounds like yeah. it could be a really great way to just get somewhere quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, my email is chuchu at global as well. If, um, right. I'll yeah. make sure that's, that's down there as well. So good. Great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so Appreciate much, Joe. Enjoy this. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.